shape to stop it from buckling like that or like that. So those cables really are working like the spokes on a wheel and holding the thing in shape. The arch and the cables work as a mutually supporting system. One without the other wouldn't work. It's the weight of the roof itself that tensions the cables and makes the arch stronger. Six kilometres of these cables stop this enormous arch from failing catastrophically. And they mean that this 11-acre roof doesn't need any supporting columns. Unobstructed views from every seat. Great for the spectators and all thanks to Cayley's glider. But this was the next problem. A big roof would be bad for the grass pitch. Wembley's roof provides 90,000 fans with seating that's sheltered from the rain. That's more than in any other stadium in the world. But what's good for the fans isn't always good for the game. The focus of any football stadium, obviously, is the pitch, the grass. To grow quality grass, you need water, ventilation and daylight. Lots of daylight. In an enclosed stadium, that's not easy to achieve. For UEFA five-star status, Wembley needed to keep its famous natural turf in tip-top condition. So the designers kept the area above the pitch open to the sky. But grass needs as much direct sunlight as possible, and that means no shadows. The answer was to retract the roof on the south side. But the south roof consists of seven giant panels, totaling over three acres. That's enough to cover St Paul's Cathedral. Engineering a sliding roof wouldn't be easy. There were three main problems. The weight of the roof itself, the effect of wind, and the need for precise positioning of each of the seven sections of the roof every time it closed. So how do you do that? The engineers turned to an invention that helped medieval archers. This connection takes me back to the Middle Ages, when defending a castle was a full-time occupation, and archers on the battlements were the front-line force. Mastering the longbow took years of training. So, warlords needed a bow that was easier to use, but just as powerful. They turned to the crossbow. They could, I'm told, be fired after little training, and they could be kept cocked, which gave the archers longer to try and take aim with it. And it meant they could fire immediately if surprised. And at first, crossbow archers needed less upper body strength. Sounds like my kind of weapon. But the early crossbow needed more power. Archery expert Steve Rouse trains Hollywood stars, and he's going to show me how a simple device made the crossbow a weapon to be reckoned with. Steve! Well, we're not making a salad, are we? No. So what are we doing? We're here to see a timeline of crossbows, to see how the power develops. First up, I'm trying the basic crossbow that, like me, needs a bit of help. Hand and inside of the string. Yeah. Then we draw it back into the nut. And what we have to do now is we'll put a bolt on there. We're going to shoot my lovely melons. Yes, OK. Up Obviously. onto your shoulder. Right. Oh, now, okay. Fingers away while fingers I load. Away. Yes, that'd be a good idea. Right. We're ready to go. So if we take good aim. OK. I'm going to fire. I missed quite badly. It wasn't just me. The strong wind made my bolt veer off course. To hit the melons, I need a way to get more power out of the crossbow. That means I need a new way to draw back my crossbow, just like the medieval archers. So when we go up in power, we have to move to the next thing, which is a more powerful crossbow that you can't span by hand. I'd like you to try and draw that back, just using your physical strength. <laughs> well, to draw this, I need to pull the equivalent of 160 kilos in weight. That's like lifting more than six bags of cement at once. Clearly. I can't pull that by hand, no. What you want is one of these. A coffee grinder? No, a Kranoquin. So this was a separate machine then? 
Oh, yes. This is the first time where you're going to get a mechanical advantage using a cog and rail. So if you wind this handle... Now, you know how hard it was a minute ago. It's impossible, yeah. But suddenly that's... But I can use one finger. Exactly. So that meant you could draw bows of immense strength. So what we've got in here as I turn this handle is it's turning a cog. It's turning a cog that turns a larger cog that sits in here. So for the first time, you've now got this machine which enables you to store more energy within the crossbow. I'm terrified of this thing once it's primed like this because it's so much energy stored in it. OK, oh. Whenever you're ready. Incoming. That's got some shove, hasn't it? Can we have a look? Yeah, I think it's buried in the next county, that one. <laughs> this bow can shoot a bolt 100 metres further than the hand-drawn one. And it's all thanks to the Cranoquin, a cog and rail system that can draw back a great weight with ease. It worked. An efficient way to use a cog and rail. But this system was only part of the inspiration for the way the engineers moved the four acres of Wembley's roof. If you look at the way this works, you turn the handle and it turns the cog and that moves the rail back. That's what draws the bowstring back. What if the system worked the other way around though? What if the rail stays still and the cog moves along it? This development in what is today known as a rack and pinion system was the next step in making Wembley's roof retract. The rack and pinion system takes us back to 1812 and the early days of steam locomotion. British engineers wanted to draw heavier loads of coal, so their steam engines needed to have enough traction. Mine manager John Blenkinsop had an idea. He added a toothed rail to his tracks and he fitted a cog to one of his engine's wheels. And it was a great success, allowing his engine to move four times more coal than earlier engines. And mountain railways like this one at Snowdon would later use the system to push passenger wagons up steep slopes. So with Blenkinsop's railway and the brilliant medieval Cranoquin proving how effective rack and pinion can be, the engineers at Wembley decided to use a similar system to move the stadium's roof. I want to see it up close, but that means climbing again, 52 metres above the pitch. The four acres of roof are currently open. So Henry Munro, Wembley's technical manager, guides me in between the stacked panels. Everything here is massive. This panel alone clocks in at 330 tonnes. That's the weight of two jumbo jets, and it runs the entire length of the pitch. Moving it is the job of the rack and pinion system. I'm here to see it in action. This is the drive unit itself. So this is a control panel? That's correct. I expect it's millions of buttons, but I suppose it can only do two things. Can we close it? Yeah, just press the button. Well, I can do it. You can do it. You'll let me drive. I'll let you drive this time. Close the roof, yeah? Close just roof. Press once, and I'm going to close the roof at Wembley Stadium. Is that a good thing? So this is where the cogs are doing their thing, driving along this toothed rail here. And they're the main drive units here. There's three of them on this side, and there's three of them on the other side there, moving it. And standing this close to it, I don't know, it, here it looks really, you can see the mechanics of it, you can see it working, but you don't get a sense of just the scale of it. Then you move back and suddenly, Everything I can see is moving that way. It's massive, isn't it? It takes 57 minutes for all 1,240 tonnes of the seven panels to fully close or open.
रिस्टार्ट